we've got some massive news for you. Wink, wink. Nudge, nudge. <laughs> this is Space News. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another rousing edition of Space News. I'm Marcus. And I'm Kevin. That's Kevin, yeah. Uh, we're here today to talk to you about some massive news, namely, the largest black hole ever was discovered this week. Right. So, and what makes this uh, black hole specifically important is that not only is it massive at 12 billion times the mass of our sun, uh, it's also one of the earliest supermassive black holes to be observed. Right. So this one, we believe, uh, uh, is observed from about 800 million years after the Big Bang. So that's pretty young. The universe is still pretty yeah. young at that point. Like one fourteenth of its current age. Right, exactly. So this is very interesting because we've never seen anything this massive that long ago, that far into the past, which challenges our way of thinking about how black holes form, especially the supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies. Right, and because their, uh, their formation mechanism is still a mystery. And now we have one of the largest ones really early and so you need to condense matter really really fast right. in order to get that to happen and nobody knows yeah that's still a a big a big puzzle but we might have found a stepping stone of sorts sort of uh there have been reports that the first intermediate mass black hole and when we say intermediate mass we mean between the mass of our sun and the mass of the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy so a few thousand times the mass of our sun. Right, exactly. Anywhere from a few hundred, I think, up to a few thousand. Yeah. Ten thousand. Um, was discovered at this uh, in another galaxy, NGC 2276. And this is important because we've observed supermassive, we've observed stel stellar mass black holes Small from ones. regular stars dying. Mm -hmm. Nothing in between. Nothing in between. There's something missing. This is the missing link, as you will. Uh, it's detected to be 50,000 solar masses, so 50,000 times the mass of our sun. And uh, it was discovered by a combination of radio and X-ray observations, which is very... Having these two separate ways of detecting it has helped sort of bolster the fact that this might actually be an intermediate mass black hole. Because we found many candidates in the past, but this seems to be probably the best chance that we have at actually detecting a real one, but we're not really sure yet. Right. It's still early it's to tell. It's still up in the air. And uh, one of the things that also bolsters this is that the fact that they believe that NGC 2276, a separate group from the one that discovered the black hole, uh, suggested that this galaxy has recently gone in, uh, recently suffered a collision or interaction with a dwarf galaxy. And usually when this happens, you have higher star formation rates. But they've also detected the fact that the star formation rate is quenched very close, about a thousand light years, I think, from the, the black hole itself. So this is just an indication that this is a very strong black hole, and it can't be something that is small. It has it can't be something that's massive. It has to be something in between. Right. So it's very fascinating stuff. But back to terrestrial yes ish things and the future of the International Space Station. Ah yes. Now, the United States has agreed to fund and support the International Space Station out to 2024, and Russia has recently just put out pretty much the exact same news, uh, but with rumblings of making their own space station afterwards either through new modules or through separating some some of their own modules from the ISS right and well the reason why that might sound a little concerning the separation of modules from the ISS is because they owned they created the ones that have like the power and uh, or some of the power stuff some of it yeah as well as um uh, what are some of the other so many other important features basically that ISS has now they've toyed with the idea of splitting off their modules and creating their own called OPSEC uh, for a few years now. You can look it up on Wikipedia. So it's not a really new idea. Just the only thing to keep in mind is this is 10 years from now. Right. And the the landscape of everything 10 years ago is very different from now. Right. So Politics there's only change. so much you can say. Right. So a lot of the a lot of rumblings about this have been because of terrestrial politics affecting what's going to be happening in space at the International Space Station and whatever Russia's next space station will be. But as Kevin just said, we don't know what the politics are going to be like 10 years from now. We're going to have either a, a, the next president in the United States or, or another, another president. It could be two presidents from now. Uh, Putin isn't going anywhere because he's a stone mountain of a man who... <laughs> The only thing that degrades him is going into the water because time has no effect on this man. Uh, but the point is, there's the Earth, the stuff that's happening here will affect what's going on in space. But 
This is 10 years. But it does go back the other way. Going back into history, the yes. Apollo Soyuz mission in 1976 had Americans and Russians exchanging gifts in space right. more than 10 years before the USSR collapsed. So astronauts and scientists and the space field are usually kind of ahead of the game in terms of peace. Right. So that may change, you know, Russia and the United States outlook in the next 10 years. Who knows? The next peace treaty might actually be signed in space. Why not? It's completely neutral territory, right? It makes yes. perfect sense. All right. The last thing, it's kind of a sad, mo- sad note, but this past Friday, Leonard Nimoy passed away. Everyone knows Leonard Nimoy, right? Spock. Yes. Live long and prosper. Uh, he passed away at the age of 83. It's a very sad moment for all, not just Star Trek fans, not just sci-fi n- nerds, everybody, because pretty much anybody recognized him. It's... I, I, Kevin, I can't even talk. He, he helps contribute to the world by pushing for tolerance, for rational thought, not just in playing Spock, but as a real person. Right, yeah. He, uh, he was always a level-headed person. And so he really contributed to the goodness of, of the world. And we have a picture up right now showing him smiling in front of the space shuttle Enterprise. Yes. Uh, this is how I like to remember him. Yeah. Uh, him and the rest the of the crew, crew of the seeing how they've been able to positively impact the world. Right. I, I saw something uh, on Friday that said that Leonard Nimoy taught us how to be more human, which is great because he played for his most notable role was yeah. playing a Vulcan who was only half human. So it's kind of, it's very fascinating that he teaches us how to be more human just as being Leonard Nimoy. So live long and prosper to all of you. And he was a man who definitely lived long and prospered. Thank you. Thank you, Leonard Nimoy. And thank you for watching this episode of Space News. If you'd like to contribute to the show, you can leave comments down below. You can also support the show by buying t-shirts over at a space TV.spreadshirt.com because it's swag and everyone likes swag. Uh, Maybe, maybe you'll get free swag someday. I don't know. Who knows? Once we get start, once we start getting that money. <laughs> uh, so thank you for watching. Yep. See and ya. We'll see you out there. Thanks for watching today's video. You can like and subscribe down below, as well as comment on all the different subjects that we talked about today. You can find other content elsewhere on the internet, so look for those links. You can also watch a random video of our channel right here. Thanks for watching.